Friends and colleagues, uh, this is Dr. Singhal again, and this is the part two video of the software development, steps in software development. Uh, please watch part one uh, to understand this one clearly. So in part one we showed that after collecting the user requirement, we need to analyze for input process and output. This one will show that how then we create flowcharts, pseudocode, and translate pseudocode to source code, and so on. Uh, this video would be a little bit longer, so if you need to pause video anytime to understand the material or go back, feel free to do so. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, flowcharts mainly use symbols given in next slide to capture program logic pictorially. And they're quite useful for the small parts. Okay. Uh, main idea is of the flowcharts is to get a high level view of program logic that builds clarity in overall software development process. Using flowcharts you can clarify your logic to a lot of people. Uh, they say that one picture is thousand words, worth thousand words, and that's true about flowcharts. And level of details in flowchart is need based. They can be high level, means fewer details, and they can be low level, that means a lot of details. Okay. And these are the flowchart symbols. And basically, this column shows the symbols, and this column shows their meaning and use. Okay, so <clears throat> ellipses are used to start a program or a module or to end it. So you'll see that in the start and the ending. Hexagon is a, called a preparation symbol that should list all the variable and constants that are used in programs. Variables store the data whose value can change constant store data whose value cannot change. This is the parallelogram. This is used when we want to show program steps that could either input the data or when we output the data. The rectangle on the other hand shows the steps that perform either the mathematical calculations or computations where the variable into which value is being stored will be on the left hand side and the expression being evaluated will be on the right hand side. And these also show if you are doing any logical computations. Diamond shows the program steps that make logical decisions and that will result in a true or false outcome. And a circle will connect various parts of the flowchart as needed. So here is shown the flowchart for the multiplication program. And basically flowcharts, as long as they depict logic flow, can flow in any direction. They don't necessarily have to go vertically down all the time. Uh, they can go sideways and the other ways and so on. Yeah. So we start the multiplication of two numbers program. Preparation symbols show that we are going to have two values, num1 and num2, provided by the user, and product will be where the values will be stored. Okay. Then we'll prompt the user to get and get the number one from them, num1, and will be stored in the memory location num1. And then we'll prompt the user to get the num2. Okay, so this should be num2, not num1. Again, there's a 
I think I copied and pasted it, didn't change that. So this should be actually num2. We get the num2. And once we got num1 and num2, so think of this as num2, then we have a memory location product. So in that one, we just multiply num1 and num2 and store the value back in uh, product. And then we print num1, print num2, and print the product, and end. So that's a high level view. It doesn't really tell you what words we are going to use when we print this. And that's, of course, will be filled a little bit later. Okay. These are the rules about flowchart. To induce precision in overall software development process and to facilitate communication among, among software developers, the rules of constructing flowcharts are very strict. Each shape in the flowchart is designed to contain a specific action which cannot be duplicated by other shapes. The words, symbols, or mathematical expressions are also required to be precise. And flowcharts are required to be independent of programming language features. If some features match in flowcharts in a programming language, that's just incidental. That's not by design. OK, so then how do we translate from flowchart to pseudocode? And we'll use the flowchart shown earlier uh, to do the pseudocode. So for simple sequential structures, flowcharts and the corresponding pseudocode is very simple for the sequential structure. However, some rules about flowcharts that we mentioned earlier and the need for precision also applies to pseudocode. Pseudocode for previous flowchart that I just showed you a minute ago, and you can get a PowerPoint copy to see it again if you like, uh, is shown in the next slide. So this is the pseudocode for the flowchart that we saw earlier. It started the same as it was in the flowchart. Inside the repression symbol, we had num1 and num2 and product. So these three were inside the repression symbol. So we just show them as this. And then there was a uh, parallelogram saying get num1. So we get that. Uh, there is another parallelogram, get num2, so we get that. And then this was inside a rectangle, product equal to num1 and num2, that's as is. We filled out a little bit more detail in the print steps, uh, and flowchart is set print num1, but he, here we put some words as well. So print means print command in the programming language. Uh, inside the Code says the text that will be printed as is. So it will print first number equals, and then comma separated is the variable value. So program already has the vari variable num1 value, so we print that. And we do exactly the same thing for the second number. We print this text, second number equals, and the value stored in the variable num2. And finally, we do the same thing for the product. That product above 2 means product this and this equals to the value stored in the product that was determined by this expression here. And then the end. So same rules. You have to have start. You have to have all the variables that will be used that were in the progression symbol, steps to get the data, any mathematical computation done and the print step. And there will be more steps in bigger programs, but and you must have an end, end statement. Okay. So that's the pseudocode. Now, we still have to do more steps uh, in the process. And we need to do the following steps that will differ based on the pro programming language we choose to convert the pseudocode that we just saw 
uh, to the source code. And we show those steps in the next slide. First is to, you have to choose a programming language in which which will be used to convert your pseudocode to the source code. Then once you have done that, you have to translate mathematical formula to be used in your program, which we had in the analysis, flowchart, and pseudocode, to the form that programming language will accept. All formulas that are mathematically correct are not necessarily programming language correct. So you'll have to do that conversion. Uh, in this case, this happens to be that we don't need any conversion, but in most cases, you will need that. And then we do line-by-line -line translation of pseudocode to source code. Okay. And then if you are using a compiler, then you compile the program or run the program through. If you are using an interpreter, run the program through interpreter. And for compiled language, the compiler is required. For interpreted languages, an interpreter is required. And then you fix any compile or interpretation errors. And then run the program with large enough set of data that all lines of code will be executed. That's the proof that your program works correctly. And then for each output, critically examine the desks and desk check the output. Fix any logical or runtime errors. This is desk, not disk. And submit the program for user testing and upgrade based on user feedback. So in this case, we will just choose the programming language of choice for this video. In fact, actually, we're going to stop, stop here because uh, from this step and onwards, uh, it'll be different. The videos from now and on in part two and three will be different for each programming language. So uh, we're actually going to go back here. So we'll do these steps because for each language like JavaScript, these steps will be different. For Java, these steps will be different. If I'm showing something in C++, it'll be different for those cases. So I'm going to show part 3, 4, and onwards differently for each language. OK? Uh, thanks for watching. And I'll be back for part 3, 4, and onwards. Uh, Currently, I'm going to do them for JavaScript and Java. And in future, I might do them for other languages like uh, C++, C Sharp, or Visual Basic.net. OK, thanks. I'll see you soon in other videos.